Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Geostrata Extra. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and we are thrilled to bring you yet another episode of this continuing series. If you have read Geostrata, our magazine, it comes out six times a year, features great technical articles, quasi-technical articles, case histories, news and notes on GI membership, all kinds of good stuff. You should check it out at readgeo.com. You can go there now if you would like to read the piece that we're going to be talking about in just a few moments from our October-November issue. Before we get to that, if you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, you should head over to geoinstitute.org after you watch this today and learn a little bit more about us. While you are there, you will find out that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and that we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and I think you will, you should click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time that we post something to the YouTube channel. So, every issue of Geostrata, we choose one article, we interview the author for a behind the scenes, stuff you didn't see in the article. That is what we are doing today. Travis Dean from Shannon and Wilson joins us all the way from the West Coast to talk about rare geologic hazards. And here to interview him is Geostrata editor Bill Peterson. Bill. The floor is All yours. right. Thanks, Brad. Um, also, like to welcome everybody today. Thanks for taking time out of your busy work day for what I think is going to be an exciting and fascinating topic. Um, the issue theme for the October November 2022 issue, which you should have received by now, is challenging sites dealing with extremes and uncertainties. And I think you will agree that the topic of today's extra meets both of those criteria in spades, that being extreme and uncertain, uh, possibly more than any other case history I remember seeing in the, uh, in the magazine. So the title of the article is A Geologic Hazard Unlike Any Other, Just When You Think You've Seen It All, Along Comes a Rare Mobile Mud Spring by Travis Dean, our guest, along with Dean Fransu and Carolina Zamora, all of Shannon and Wilson. And I will be interviewing Travis today. I'm Bill Peterson. I'm a principal consultant with RIMCIS in the Philadelphia area, working primarily in the area of geotechnical forensics. Um, I have been on the editorial board since 06, but this will be my debut as host for a live stream interview event. Um, now, this article was of particular interest to me for a couple of reasons. Firstly, um, I started my career at Shannon and Wilson albeit in the Seattle office, and spent a good part, if not most of my time, out on railroad emergencies all over the West. And I thought I saw a lot, but I have to admit I never saw anything remotely like we're going to be looking at today. Um, the other thing of interest was that, unlike a typical geotechnical emergency event, if you will, 
that happens at a, a discrete point in time and space, this mobile mud spring was moving through both time and space, which really presented a lot of extra challenges, as you will see. So I will go ahead and introduce Travis. He is the vice president and branch manager of Shannon and Wilson's Los Angeles office. He has 30 years of experience as a geotech engineer, the last 19 of which with Shannon and Wilson. So uh, we missed each other at the firm by a few years, but we have met once or twice over the years at uh, the National Arima Conference. Travis got his Bachelor of Science at University of the Pacific, followed by a master's from California Berkeley. He's licensed in several Western states in addition to California. And he's got experience with horizontal and vertical construction on both traditional design bid build as well as design build projects, including tunnels, bridge foundations, retaining walls, excavation support, earthwork construction, and the mitigation of geologic hazards, including liquefaction, landslides, soft soils, and gassy ground. Um, now, I'm not real familiar with that last term, but I'm guessing, Travis, that you added that to your resume after this particular project, unless you've done others. I've done one other, but this is this is the main one. Yeah, this is the big one. OK, yeah. um, so we're expecting there may be some questions today, given the uh, the nature of the presentation. So if you have questions, type them into the chat box. Brad will be monitoring those and we'll get to as many as time allows at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, Travis, just as a little bit of uh, background information, assuming that many or most of our readers really have no experience with mud pots, uh, mud springs, and the like, aside from uh, maybe viewing one from a boardwalk in Yellowstone, which would be the case for myself. Um, be nice, maybe take some time to explain the process in more detail, particularly um, as it relates to the geologic conditions at this site. Sure, Bill, and I appreciate the introduction here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, um, two things there. One is that uh, I can uh, give the introduction here with a presentation. I'll share my screen, um, get that part going here. All right. Um, and uh, um, also uh, with the presentation, there's some videos that uh, gives you a much better appreciation of uh, what uh, we were up against. Uh, we being uh, not only Shannon Wilson, but the Union Pacific Railroad's engineering team and the contractor that the uh, railroad hired. So. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, uh, team, uh, a lot of players on this team, and that uh, was uh, definitely a, a big effort uh, to to keep the railroad operational. Which I will say that we were successful in that in that regard. So, so without further ado, let me just kind of walk through some uh, um, some of the uh, presentation here. Um, get that part going. So, uh, just as a, a background, our geologic setting. We are in the very south end of the San Andreas Fault. Um, it's a very tectonic, acti tectonically active part of the uh, world. Um, in this area, there's uh, nearby um, uh, mud pots, uh, kind of like uh, Bill was describing in Yellowstone. Um, several of these were mapped earlier. Um, this is a study done by uh, um, uh, uh, one of the co-authors, Dr. David Lynch, who helped us with our uh, uh, diagnosing the uh, mud spring I'll talk about here in a moment, uh, but uh, he mapped this uh, area back in uh, 2008, um, and it was stationary uh, near the railroad tracks and the state highway. So there's also mud pots nearby um, that had been there for quite a long time as well, which I'll show a video of that in a moment. But the question becomes, uh, what is a mud pot? Um, so as uh, Bill mentioned, Yellowstone is, a, is a well known for these uh, features. Uh, this part of the world, not so much, uh, but uh, it's powered by a gas uh, generated from uh, ge the geothermal activity we, we have out there. Uh, the crust is relatively thin, um, and the, uh, in fact, the uh, site is about 100 feet below sea level. Um, so this gas is composed of uh, um, carbon dioxide um, and uh, a little bit of hydrogen sulfide. It's being heated from the, uh, uh, the, the relatively close mantle uh, out there. Uh, the uh, hotter rocks, uh, um, and it's uh, uh, causing the calcareous sediments from the Colorado River, the limestones and stuff that uh, have eroded down, to heat up and uh, turn into uh, carbon dioxide gas. 
So under pressure, that gas will come to the surface. Uh, when it uh, does that, it carries up uh, groundwater, and that groundwater um, mixes with the what's pretty much a, a clay sediment uh, at the uh, in the area, um, and that resulting discharge that uh, comes out of this is often like a, a bubbling mud slurry. Uh, it can be hot in some places. Uh, in our case, it was about oh, 90 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit, uh, give or take. Now, these mud pots, they appear and they disappear, but they are generally stationary. And uh, um, that's kind of the odd one about this one. So there, we've experienced a little bit of a lag here. Um, not sure how uh, soon the video comes up, but this is some of the nearby mud pots that I'm showing here on the screen. Again, it's uh, kind of a, just a, a muddy uh, uh, pond mix there. Uh, Bill, that video go through? Um, I don't see any movement on my screen. Okay, okay. I'll get to another one here, and I'll, we'll switch we'll switch gears here in a moment. Um, so let me uh, um, go through quickly how the the mud spring came to be. Um, uh, there is a uh, um, this is our site here on the middle of the screen here um, that we'll be talking about where the mud spring uh, that we saw it was located at. There was a possible uh, mud spring back in 1953. This is when this photo was uh, aerial photograph was uh, taken. Um, we're not sure if it's related or not, but let me go to another image here that's more recent. Um, and this is about uh, um, uh, 2016, I believe is this, no, sorry, 2015 is this image. Um, and the mud spring was located at this location for since about 2002 to 2016. Uh, the 1953 um, uh, mud spring that I showed earlier was gone. Again, not sure if there was a relationship between the two or not. We couldn't see anything from the uh, subsequent aerial photographs, photographs between those uh, years. Um, and then uh, um, subsequent uh, aerial photographs showed it uh, here in October 25th, just to the south, uh, 2017. And then when we came out on the scene, which I'll show here in a moment, it was actually much closer to the railroad tracks uh, on uh, May 4th, 2018. And again, it, we'll... we'll walk you through how it morphs across the uh, tracks here. So we switch gears. I'm going to switch out the PowerPoint and go to a video. Bear with me a moment. Hopefully this works out better. So this is our first day. Um, and Bill, give me a thumbs up when the video comes up on your screen with the lag here. Okay. So it's on, it's, there's just no movement. Yet. Okay. It's kind of cycling through it. Okay. So yeah. These are very large videos, so it takes a moment uh, for things, I guess, to buffer and uh, to show up here. But uh, what it's showing is the mud spring when we saw it. My colleague, Dean Fransu, in the background is setting out stakes at so 10 foot intervals. Forward, and I'll start south, narrating here, so I'll stop. Background. the drainage ditch while we were here the water has gone down and maybe about a foot or so panning out you'll see occasional bubbles come out as I pan further away again the original pond from the aerial photos from uh, about 10 years ago was in this area. Distance wise, we're looking at about uh, 75 feet or so, 2,500 feet. So I'm not gonna show the whole video here, but that's kind of the gist of uh, what we saw out there. Um, and again, you can go back to the PowerPoint here. Um, put that back on. <clears throat> okay, so um, so we started measuring um, the movement of the mud spring 
as it was approaching the uh, um, tracks. And uh, again, we measured off the closest track, main track one. Um, and at the time we were out there, it was about 80 feet uh, distance. So on May 4th. So I'll stop there real quick. Bill, do you have any questions or, or comments? Or should I, just I, keep just, going? Uh, I guess the main takeaway is that uh, for the underlying condition for this to happen is you need this sort of unusual combination of deep calcareous sediments and seismic activity. Um, I guess, does that summarize it in a nutshell? Correct. Uh, um, with the uh, um, seismic activity, um, there was uh, um, some uh, indication that this mud spring moved um, following a series of uh, what they call an earthquake swarm, which is common out there. Um, back in about, I believe it was 2016, 2017 uh, time frame, um, the uh, um, mud spring until that uh, event had been fairly uh, um, stationary. Um, and then when the event occurred, um, it was uh, noticed that the uh, uh, mud spring started to move uh, towards the southwest in a rather coherent linear fashion. Um, and uh, the thoughts are it may be following a, a, a fault trace uh, that uh, uh, kind of kept it uh, kept it going. So that was one of the several theories that uh, uh, to describe the uh, the movement of the mud spring. Uh -huh. So so when this thing first came on the radar of of the railroad, um, was it just you know, track workers noticing this thing getting closer, or how did that evolve? Yeah, we were called out uh, actually. Um, uh, back in uh, uh, late 2017, we were working on the railroad uh, for various projects nearby, and we kept hearing from some of the railroad workers that there is a, a geyser or something they want us to uh, possibly go take a look at. So we heard about this for about six or seven months before we went out there. Um, and uh, at the time, uh, uh, when I met the uh, uh, MTM Israel Torres with Union Pacific Railroad uh, on the uh, site, uh, he had uh, noticed that, uh, or he had commented to me that the mud springs seemed much closer to the tracks than what he recalled from last going out there. So, so there was certainly alarm um, from the railroad about uh, is this thing going to stop or is it going to come and approach our tracks. So, mm -hmm. so that's uh, when we did the aerial photograph review and and said, yeah, this thing is really moving uh, pretty quickly toward your tracks. So gotcha. this is our this is our initial trace, um, and uh, let me skip this video real quick, Archie. So this is the the mud spring as we saw it uh, here, um, and the pond it formed we call it the caldera uh, for lack of a better term. Um, and what the issue we saw was that as the mud spring was advancing towards the track, the wave action was actually eroding. Um, let me see. Don't want my I'll fix my pointer here. Uh, was eroding out the uh, uh, the edge of the pond, um, and uh, so the while the mud spring was still about 80 feet away, the uh, um, the edge of the pond itself was about uh, 60 feet away from the tracks. So again, so that was kind of the uh, uh, the big one of the big drivers for uh, um, uh, getting the uh, um, the mud spring under control quickly. Okay. So I know you've got a lot of real nice slides and videos that uh, go way beyond the you know space allowed for in the article. So at this point, I'll just step back and uh, let you walk through the action. Sure. So um, what we did out there initially was uh, um, we talked about doing borings and such uh, like a normal geotext would want to do to kind of see and find out what was going on at depth. Uh, pretty quickly realized that was not a good idea with the gas pressures uh, coming out uh, uh, both from the mud spring and then the general vicinity. Um, so we turned to geophysics uh, and uh, um, brought out uh, GeoVision out of Corona, California. Uh, and uh, they asked what kind of imaging should we plan on doing? And uh, the response was, we'll bring everything because we're not sure exactly what we're imaging uh, at the time. And uh, so uh, um, the image shown here on the screen, um, uh, it was the best resolution. Uh, it was a uh, uh, seismic refraction lines that we did out there. Uh, it showed a couple of dense layers, um, some uh, faults that they interpreted uh, from the uh, image here. Um, and then they also noticed that there's some sort of structure, and this is right at the tracks uh, um, themselves where we did this one line. So we're about 80 feet away from the, uh, uh, the mud spring location. And what indicated from uh, uh, the interpretation was that, yeah, there's upwelling going on here. And there's every reason now to believe that the mud spring was going to, you know, be coming uh, towards the tracks. So with that said, um, uh, 
as we were trying to diagnose what the, you know, how to attack this issue, the mud spring itself jumped about 20 feet in a week um, uh, towards the uh, towards the mainline track. So uh, we knew we didn't have any time to study this thing uh, because it kept uh, moving at that pace that would be on the uh, the railroad here within about two months. Um, so with that uh, um, in mind, we decided after some discussions to construct a sheet pile wall to buy us time more than anything. Um, the idea would be that, uh, well, the steel won't erode uh, of the sheet pile, so at least we could contain it while we come up with a kind of a, a plan of a attack here and slow this thing down. So at the same time, we also, with that water um, and the agitation of the uh, uh, spring on the sides of the pond, decided to dewater the uh, caldera, so we run in pumps to, to pull the water out. And uh, um, some of the things that we also did was put in riprap, but uh, um, one of the things we discovered pretty quickly with the riprap placement was that the uh, mud spring would kind of just march right through it and uh, basically the riprap would disappear. Um, so that uh, uh, really didn't uh, do anything. It was the uh, um, the sheet piles that slowed down the progress. Again, dewatering the pond. We also reached out uh, to various uh, scientific uh, uh, agencies and uh, such. Uh, in fact, uh, um, in addition to the California Geological Survey, we also contacted the USGS. Uh, and when they came out, they didn't have any explanation of what was going on either, other than tell us, well, because the, the terminology that we were using up until then was like a geyser or a mud or a mud pot or something like that. They said, nah, call it a mud spring. And then we said, well, it kind of moves. And they said, well, call it a mobile mud spring. Like okay, <laughs> so so with that, uh, uh, we also had NASA and uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out of Pasadena come out to take a look at this to see they did some imaging out there to try to see what kind of deformations were going on, and those studies, to my knowledge, are still ongoing uh, as uh, as uh, we speak here. Uh, we talked uh, uh, to we hired uh, uh, Professor David Lynch who studied these mud mud pots and did that study I showed in that earlier slide to help us, and he came up with some theories as far as how the mud spring moved. Um, in the meantime, uh, as we were putting the mitigation measures in place, we started to, the railroad started to build what's called a shoe fly track or a detour track uh, to the opposite side of where the uh, mud spring was at at the time. The mud spring was to the east of the tracks, and we decided to, or the railroad decided to construct a western shoe fly track to the west uh, so that, uh, um, you know, we had that as a contingency. We also decided to uh, try to uh, see if we can uh, install some relief wells, uh, which I'll show you in a moment, to depressurize the gas feeding the mud spring to see if we can stop it that way. Um, so a couple of things. Here's the uh, mud path, uh, um, uh, the mud spring path uh, going towards the railroad tracks. And here, um, uh, shown here is the uh, sheet pile wall we installed. And I'll get a video on that I'll show here in a moment. So the sheet piles, and again, riprap, when it went through uh, um, uh, towards the uh, sheet piles, it basically just essentially ate the riprap. It, the riprap kind of fell into the uh, um, mud spring and disappeared on us. But also, I've mentioned uh, a set of pumps to dewater it. Uh, so again, the pond you see here is now uh, pretty much uh, got a little bit of water left, but pretty much was emptied out and uh, uh, transferred that water to a drainage ditch. So again, the uh, the caldera um, was here. The mobile mud spring in this uh, photo is shown here. Uh, again, the riprap that was put in initially, uh, which uh, uh, bought us not much time at all, um, was there. And then the sheep piles were behind it. So let me switch here to again to video. So this is another long video. Um, pull that up real quick. So this is a. Uh, um, Dr. Lynch, uh, um, let me know when you have the video there, Bill. Okay. Okay. Still, still waiting. So, Dr. Lynch right. had a had a drone that he could uh, had he brought out, uh, um, and uh, on this picture drone video uh, is the uh, the um, the mud spring and the sheet pile driving that we were doing. So again, mud spring. See, my cursor is located right here towards the middle of the screen. As we twist around, we'll come in uh, um, below it. <clears throat> a couple of things to note on this video as it pans out towards the uh, uh, the southwest. You'll see standing on the ground here, uh, especially over this parking lot uh, further to the west. Uh, again, that's indications of the mud spring, the water that's being um, pushed up 
in this area uh, from the mud spring was again marching towards that same destination. In the background here is the Salton Sea. Um, here's the state highway here, which later got impacted by the mud spring. And as we come down, a couple of things to note between us, uh, the railroad and the highway is a, uh, a Kinder Morgan pipeline. We had to, we helped reroute that out of the way, so that wasn't impacted. And then we come down here as you see the sheet piles being installed to uh, temporarily block uh, the uh, mud spring. And also here the uh, pumps uh, going um, with the mud spring as well. We come in for a landing here. Let me switch back to the uh, PowerPoint. Pull it back up on the screen. <sighs> Skip this video. Okay, so once we dewatered the uh, the pond, we were hoping to see some sort of indication of the path of the uh, mud spring. It was essentially a, a there was nothing there that uh, was obvious. Um, so the uh, uh, mud spring was uh, um, essentially moving again as a uh, uh, discrete point um, and basically left no real trace of it behind it uh, that uh, we could we could discern. Um, so a short video here that shows the how the mud spring was again stopped by the uh, uh, sheet piles. So you see the sheet piles come in the background. You should see a, a train back behind there. We kept the tracks uh, operational here. And this was in July um, through October. So again, with the sheet piles in place, as mentioned, we, were, we held it in place through October of 2018. Um, that gave us time to construct the Western Shoe Fly Track. Um, and again, as shown in this uh, um, screen here, we uh, built it to the um, opposite side of the uh, um, tracks because uh, we didn't have confidence that the sheet piles would contain the uh, mud spring for a, a, you know, indefinitely. We didn't know how, um, how soon it would break through if it did. Uh, we wanted to be ready for it. Again, another uh, uh, ground video here. So, going to warn yourself, the mud spring is over to my left. Um, sheet piles that were driven here. Um, and uh, let me back up a step. Um, here is shown as the uh, um, one of the relief wells we're putting in. So, uh, the relief wells uh, um, were a bit of a challenge. Uh, again, with the high gas pressures here. We had a lot of blood, so I'll show this one, and it may take a moment to, to queue up here. So this is one of the uh, few blowouts we had out here, and this what came out of here was all the drilling mud, which the drillers had brought out. Uh, I think they called it a barium mud, which is one of the thickest and, and heaviest muds you can find, and then the uh, pressures on this thing still blew it out. So uh, um, as we were doing this work, uh, um, uh, we noticed that the sheet piles were starting to tilt uh, uh, about in August. Um, we attempted to buttress the, the sheet piles with a riprap. Um, and then uh, we uh, learned that there were, we saw that the mud spring was getting below the sheet piles. This is getting into October, which we had a gas explosion, um, we'll talk about here in a moment, which closed the mainline tracks, but we did uh, cut over to the Western Shoe Fly Track, the detour track we constructed over the summer fairly quickly um, and had the trains back up and running within about 12 hours. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about another detour track we built to the east of where the mud spring was here in a moment. So now the mud spring is on the opposite side of where it was in the sheet piles uh, uh, through the summer here. So this again graphic shows the, the mud spring path um, and our sheet piles uh, installed there. And as it was again contained behind the sheet pile before it broke out, um, uh, it was the nose here, but we don't have anything but So hopefully the uh, the video showed the uh, erosion of the uh, um, sheet piles as it was uh, um, uh, kind of moving back and forth along where the sheet piles were contained. We had it uh, the sheet pile set up so it was 100 feet uh, length with two wing walls coming off at a 45 degree angle. So we kind of caged it, um, but it did kind of behave like a caged animal almost. Um, it was pretty interesting to watch, and but it pretty much cleaned off all the soil on the uh, eastern side of the sheet piles while it was trying to get through it. Um, such that it started to lean, as shown in this image here, uh, towards the east, away from the tracks, and we were now concerned we were going to lose the sheet piles as they started to uh, lose lose uh, soil support. 
So we'd put a tilt meter on the sheet piles as this was happening. Um, and uh, the trend of it uh, shown in the blue line was increasingly uh, um, uh, um, uh, tilting uh, into the mud spring. And uh, um, we placed again rip wrap uh, to try to stabilize things as shown here. <laughs> Show the increasing tilt and the rip wrap. Um, so here's a rip wrap. Uh, somebody uh, uh, who uh, shall remain nameless decided to try and see if we can put a, a t uh, pipe in there. Well, that didn't work. Uh, try to see if they can contain it that way. Uh, but uh, again, that was more of a nuisance than anything else. And again, you can see in the background here the sheep piles, how pretty much how cleaned off they are from when the mud spring just kind of was going back and forth along the edge of the sheep piles, taking all the soil out. So again, this is another uh, shot of the uh, um, uh, tilt meter data. Um, again, the riprap uh, had stabilized things for a short time, um, but then uh, we also started to notice that the sheep piles were starting to plunge. Uh, so that also set off alarm bells, and this is in late September, early October. So here's an image of the sheep piles. The original uh, installation was level, um, and now it had plunged in some places up to 18 inches. Um, and this is uh, October 4th. <sighs> so um, another short video I'll show here. Um, this is eight, eight o'clock in the morning, October 4th. And this is the first indication that this mud spring had jumped the sheet piles. So this little mud pot that formed out in front that morning. Again, mud was coming and gas was coming through the sheet piles as well on, uh, on that morning. So we knew we were in trouble um, and we had actually already closed down the mainline tracks wherever it did in anticipation of uh, shifting over to the Western shoe fly track. Um, so when the uh, short sheep piles were breached, uh, which was later that day on October 4th, uh, we had the Western shoe fly track set up. So I'm gonna show another video. Um, I'll run this on the PowerPoint, uh, Bill, if it's too choppy, um, I can switch over to the video, but uh, this is another drone image taken the following day. And a few things to, to note here um, is that the mud spring, which was here, had disappeared on the east side of the sheep piles furthest from the tracks. It now appeared at the new location on the west side. This sinkhole formed within a few minutes. Uh, it basically it was a gas explosion that was uh, observed out here that caused this whole sinkhole area to collapse in on itself. The hey, sheep Travis, piles are, we're, we're still seeing that graph up right now. I don't know. Okay, if let me like switch. Yeah, let me switch over the video then. So I should have done that. Okay. Bear with me a moment. There you go. Uh, let's see this one. Okay, let me, let me have the video here. I understand there's probably still a little bit of a lag here. Yeah, okay, so. Okay, so what you're looking at now is basically the sheet piles uh, um, were breached. Uh, a sinkhole formed here at the uh, um, uh, edge of the mainline tracks, um, shutting those down. Uh, the uh, sinkhole itself happened pretty quickly in the early afternoon, October 4th, um, witnessed by myself and several others. Uh, the whole ground kind of lifted up uh, as gas was coming out and then just collapsed in on itself. So uh, unfortunately, we would all stay pretty far away because we knew something was up over here when it happened. But the uh, tracks uh, um, were closed here. The mainline tracks shown in the image as we as we swirl around here. Um, and then you can see the train now running on the western shoe fly track that we had set up. Um, uh, so that, uh, again, this, during this whole uh, incident, they, we only lost uh, about uh, 12 hours of, of uh, uh uh, train traffic time. <clears throat> if I could interject real quick, um, you can't see it in the current screen, but um, that inclined pipe, it looks like your figure five from the article. I was kind of curious about that. So it sounds like they put that in to act as a sort of king pile to support the sheet pile wall. So it was originally in contact with it. It was not in contact with it. Actually, it was. They were trying to uh, um, see if they could funnel the mud spring into uh, a tube, um, a steel tube, to try to contain it that way. And this was, oh. uh, yeah, a couple days before. Yeah, so, so we kind of advised them that's nah, not probably going to probably not going to work. <laughs> but uh, they went ahead and tried it anyways. Um, and then uh, we had a heck of a time trying to yank it out once uh, once the mud spring had jumped through the uh, the uh, sheet piles here. 
Oh, so that's how it ended up inclined like that. You're trying to get rid of it. Yeah, we're trying to actually pull it out. So, which was a little more problematic than than the contractor thought. But uh, a couple of things to notice in the video. Also, you'll see there's a drill rig set up uh, just to the north there. That was our last uh, relief well attempt. Um, on that one, we actually showed some promise. Uh, it, showed, it looked like it was it was starting to tap into gas and quite a bit of gas, and we were hoping that would impact the uh, mud spring, but. By the time that happened, this thing had jumped the sheet pile, so we stopped. Uh, we stopped the relief well effort on that. Let me switch back over to the PowerPoint again. So now the uh, uh, mud spring um, again had uh, uh, jumped over the tracks and the sheet piles uh, shown here um, was in the main lines. Again, the western shoe fly track was open. As the mud spring got a little further away, we actually, the railroad actually went in and put a second track back in on the east side, um, we call it the eastern shoe fly track, um, and uh, had, uh, again, uh, two tracks reopened here um, by uh, November um, of 2018. So within a month of this thing pushing through the, uh, or breaking through the sheet piles, uh, the railroad was back to full operations, with the exception that they had to slow the trains down through here uh, because of the uh, the turns and stuff. Uh, but uh, um, you know, we were, the railroad was pretty much back in business uh, as far as the uh, operations go. Again, the mud spring continued on its path. Uh, and eventually, we had to close down the western shoe fly track as it made its way towards the state highway at the top of the screen there. So, again, we continued to track it. Uh, it uh, had indications that it was kind of slowing down um, as it was going through the mainline tracks, which is a little frustrating because we were hoping this thing would go on its merry way and uh, we can put the tracks back and be back in business. Um, again, during this time, we put the Eastern shoe fly track in, um, we did some final repairs out there. Um, but, uh, um, again, I'll show a video here in a moment that, uh, shows it as of uh, last month where it's at, uh, the average movement on this thing was about 10 feet a month, um, uh, as it uh, crossed through the tracks, uh, here, but of course it was, uh, uh rather, uh, sporadic movements that, uh, that we observed out there. So this last video I'm going to show here, let me switch back over to, this will be the last uh, image here. <clears throat> I was out there um, with Kinder Morgan Pipeline here uh, in early September. Um, and this is the mud spring as it stands today. So it's September 1st, <clears throat> 2022. Mud spring. There's actually two of them. Um, I don't really remove very much. The uh, pipelines shown here are the Kinder Morgan Pipelines uh, that uh, are abandoned and moved over here. Um, Look at the relief well, which you got photos of. Uh, relief well one in particular is still very active. Look down here a bit. So this is the shoulder of the road. And you can measure it off the uh, end of the guardrail there. And again, in the far back here, there's a second mud spring back there, a smaller one. Again, kind of moving with like back towards the tracks a little bit. That is a bit of a concern. <clears throat> yeah, what's going on? All right, so. That is the end of my uh, little presentation here. Um, happy to uh, um, answer questions there, Bill, and uh, uh, certainly, uh, yeah. You probably have a few time for a few more from me. Um, I guess one of the obvious questions um, would be, what, what were some of the safety concerns for workers on the site and what kind of precautions had to be undertaken? Um, I guess the only gas being ejected, it sounds like it was pretty much just CO2. So I don't know if there was any issues with, you know, spark ignition or, you know, people smoking or, you know, things like that. And was anyone ever injured? Uh, no, no injuries um, uh, that uh, we had the entire time we were out there. Um, and uh, um, I will say the carbon dioxide gas is, is it's, it's benign except for one problem um, because the, um, the mud spring itself was, um, uh, kind of in this, this depression, the caldera pond and such, uh, especially when we dewatered it, uh, carbon dioxide gas is, is when it concentrates a little, um, little, uh, let me uh, 
change the video here real quick. Um, um, it's heavier than air, uh, so it would tend to get trapped in there. And uh, um, the problem became is if you went into the uh, the into the the pond when it was dewatered, you could get as asphyxiated if the uh, the wind was enough, for example, or something like that. And we did see indication of that. Unfortunately, a couple of uh, birds and some other uh, animals got in there and uh, um, you know died uh, from uh, asphyxiation being in there. So that was the biggest uh, issue there. Um, but nothing really flammable. Uh, the hydrogen sulfide was in pretty minute amounts. We we had gas meters out there uh, measuring it, and never uh, approached the uh, lower lower explosive limits. Uh -huh. So the eastern shoe fly was built. It would seem over directly over the path of this thing. Was that um, was that over a riprap uh, backfill put in? And were there any long term settlement issues with that? There was, yeah, it was a, a hurried operation to backfill uh, where the uh, once the sheep piles or once the uh, mudspring had jumped the sheep piles. Um, so the railroad uh, um, put the riprap that we had uh, gathered for uh, uh, various reasons uh, into the uh, um, to backfill the uh, um, old pond, the original Caldera Pond I showed at the start of the, of the presentation. Um, and then uh, 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 once that was backfilled, they put the tracks down, but yeah, they had to have a what's called a tamper machine come out and re-level the tracks fairly frequently, as you anticipate uh, for the first couple months, probably on the order of maybe once or twice a week. Um, but it gradually tapered off as things settled down and reached equilibrium out there, <laughs> um, to the point where I think they were, you know, last I checked in with them, it was probably maybe once every other month or maybe even once a quarter. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay. Um, so in the article, you talked about uh, four different options that were evaluated and that they were all deemed infeasible. Uh, I was wondering maybe you just say a few words about each one and, you know, what the pros and cons might have been and why it was eliminated. It was um, relocating the tracks to the east, which ultimately was done, really. Uh, temporary bridge, plugging the mud spring, and ground improvement. Correct. So one of the early d items uh, before the... Uh, um, let me change my screen here. Uh, before the uh, um, uh, mud spring, before we drill the sheep piles, even uh, one of the first things we talked about was relocating the tracks pretty far to the east, uh, um, up to a uh, half or three quarter of a mile. Um, but uh, given the geometry of the tracks, this would be a permanent relocation. Um, and the fact that there's farmers' fields and other infrastructure built around us that proved to be pretty un, uh, unfeasible, um, you know, as far as the uh, railroad's concerned was. So that was abandoned pretty quickly. Um, and then the uh, uh, one thing we did look at pretty uh, closely was the uh, um, uh, using a temporary bridge. The railroad had uh, basically, it was almost like a kit um, that they'd bring out uh, for a, about a 70 foot bridge, um, which they brought to the site the problem uh, that occurred to us is that uh, when the mud spring was still f far enough away from the tracks, we didn't know exactly where to site the center of the bridge. Uh, because if the uh, mud spring uh, moved towards one of the abutments uh, for the new bridge, then we would uh, um, uh, have some issues there. Uh, we talked about plugging of the mud spring. Um, that was brought up a couple of times. The concern there was, well, if we plug it, does that mean this is going to come up somewhere else that we don't expect? Um, so we nixed that uh, that one pretty early because given the risk of directly impacting the mud spring, you know, and it popped up, say, on the state highway or um, the main lines or somewhere else that we couldn't predict was deemed too risky. Um, the last piece of ground improvement we looked at, uh, we did come up with some schemes uh, working with some ground, ground improvement contractors to see if we could uh, um, put in uh, um, uh, either like DSM columns or um, some other uh, uh, inclusions uh, to basically, you know, redirect or at least uh, protect the tracks in place. Uh, again, that was deemed unfeasible only because, one, there was lack of time um, as the thing was approaching the track. And two, um, we weren't sure how, uh, how much the uh, the DSM or, or whatever uh, uh, ground improvements option we were looking at would actually support uh, um, the uh, um, tracks should a big void space be correct, created by the, uh, by the mud spring underneath. So again, those were thought about, but uh, we didn't decide to, at the end of the day to go there. Okay. Um, I guess uh, since this whole thing happened, uh, has the railroad 
incorporated any type of uh, routine inspection or anything? Are they concerned about this happening again? I suppose it's something that they probably never thought of and now it's front and center. Exactly. Yeah, they they do regular inspections of this area uh, and, this, and particularly this, uh, this location here. I'm in regular contact with the MTM, uh, Israel Torres. Uh, he always he gives me a heads up on anything new. I think the 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 last video I showed, uh, which was my site visit to check in with uh, the Kinder Morgan Pipeline folks there um, back in early September, uh, kind of showed the mud spring was fairly stationary. Uh, hadn't really moved too much uh, in the last uh, um, probably the last six months. Um, so it. Uh, we think maybe it found its happy spot. Um, the idea being that uh, um, the source of the mud spring was somewhere to the southwest of where the actual surface feature was, and so with the erosion of the uh, and the agitation of the not only the the water but the gas uh, eroding out the clay soils out there, we were thinking that the uh, as it tra traverses this fault um, that it was trying to get to a vertical state where it was right over where the source of the thing was, um, uh -huh. the source of the gas at depth. So that may be where it ended up, which is right on the state highway, essentially. Um, and the, the Caltrans, the uh, state uh, DOT, had to relocate their highway, kind of like we did with the first uh, Western Shoe Flight tracks, to the west as a bypass. Uh, so they detour the road uh, around there to uh, get around this thing as well. Uh -huh. So I did get a hold of the, a copy of the paper by Lynch and Hudnut, and um, it, was, it was pretty interesting. Um, couple issues they talk about with the mud pots in general is that um you know the, the activities related to you know precipitation and depth of the groundwater and it, it's got similarities to to karst processes um but in my mind it almost is like karst acting in reverse where instead of soil migrating down into bedrock voids that you've got upwelling of hot water and uh, mobilizing sediments in that direction um have, are you aware of any updates of, of their studies or anything change on that end not recently um i last talked to david lynch about a year or so ago um and they he was kind of focused on uh, looking at how the mechanism mechanisms moved or mud spring mechanism moved and how that all behaved I'm trying to get more information about that uh but uh, you're correct i mean it's similar in car topography but uh the uh, um, the gas and the and the water agitation basically erodes the soil out at depth, and then makes its way to the surface. Um, again, typically these things will, will once they reach the surface will stay fairly stationary. But in our case, yeah, this was the first one that actually was kind of moving along uh, along this uh, what we think was a fault seam out there. So the studies are ongoing. I haven't had any recent updates uh, other than uh, um, yeah, they're they're still trying to puzzle this thing out. So in the course of your research, um, did you come across any similar case histories involving a, a moving mud pot or, or even a stationary one that had to be dealt with from a geotechnical standpoint? There was one instance of uh, a mud pot up in Yellowstone National Park uh, that uh, was reported to have moved a couple hundred feet. And the only re reason we found out about that was actually one of my uh, uh, senior geologists, Dean Fransu, was on vacation there. And he actually went... Uh, looking for information about that and, and came across this one mud spot, but it was in the middle of a forest. So, um, so nobody actually, you know, was there to document its movement other than it was sighted in one area and then showed up in another location other, other than that. On ours, you know, we reached out, like I said, uh, not only the uh, um, uh, national geology firms or national geology agencies and other uh, um, universities and such, but I also did an international uh, search uh, trying to find out if anybody's seen this with mud pots, mud pots or mud springs in the other part of the world. Again, we got nobody's ever seen anything like this back. So we had no real playbook and no real, uh, um, um, you know, way to, to mitigate this thing uh, that somebody else had done previously. Yeah, I mean, it struck me that there probably was very little you could do to stop it other than uh, – just try to hop over it and let it ride by and, and, and hope for the best. Yeah, and ultimately that was the way to go. Um, again, we looked at all these other options as it was happening. And again, knowing that we didn't have much time to work with. The first thing, you know, with the sheep piles was we need to buy ourselves some time so we can come up with different plans. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, looking back and all how this all folded out or unfolded here for us on the road, 
I really don't see any other way to have dealt with it other than to do the dance of moving uh, tracks around and making shoe fly tracks. Again, to, with the with the intent to keep the trains running while this thing went through the uh, the railroads right away. Looked like it all turned out pretty well in the end. Um, so we do have a couple questions here. Um, this one may have been posted prior to what I think you answered it already. Uh, John Pescator is asking that the pipe looks like it was supposed to act as a standpipe to equalize pressure, question mark. Yeah, no, the uh, the pipe, the intent there was to um, basically almost like a uh, um, straw down the throat of this thing, uh, keep it from moving uh, temporarily um, as, a, as, a, as a measure to uh, keep it stationary so it wouldn't uh, jump the sheep piles when it started to, you know, in that early October time frame, we really started to move uh, past those sheep piles. So it was an idea that somebody had, uh, um, they asked our opinion, we said, mm, it's probably not going to work, but they went ahead and did it anyways. Uh huh. Okay, we've got another question um, from Stony Mather. In the future, will the mud spring jump back to the east and or retrace its path? We haven't seen any indication of it retracing its path. Um, it moved a little further to the south when I left because I we ended up uh, our our work with the Union Pacific Railroad ended in January 2020. And then this site visit I had with Kenny Morgan here about a month ago. Um, uh, um, Took another look at it. It really moved a little to the south, um, but it was still along the shoulder of the highway, which is where I left it uh, back in uh, two years ago. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, interesting thing I, I mentioned in this last video that uh, a smaller mud spring had opened up uh, back towards the tracks a little uh, to the south and east, um, but it was fairly small. And from all indications, that hadn't really moved either. So it looks like, cross your fingers, it's stationary for now. Again, hopefully uh, that stays that way. Uh -huh. um, so that's all the questions that I'm seeing so far. So I just have a, a final question. Um, I think the state highway you're referring to, that's uh, that was California 111, is that right? Correct. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I, I jumped on Street View to get a little lay of the land and uh, it, it's a pretty remote area, you know, desert type of setting. I was wondering, did that have any impact on the repair? Um, process or just because I guess everything was brought in on the rail, maybe it wasn't as much of a factor as it typically would be. Yeah, for the rail side, I mean, we brought in uh, um, uh, a couple of rock trains with a riprap that they would mine from uh, sources that uh, were as far away as like Utah um, to, again, when we were trying to contain it, uh, but also um, backfilling. Uh, so they were, it was pretty easy by rail to get in there or easy for the railroad, of course, to get in there with the rail cars to uh, on low materials, the state highway was a little different uh, um, because even though it's in a remote area, there's not a whole lot of good detours out there. In fact, uh, when they closed the highway initially to do some of the repairs, uh, when the Mudspring approached the highway, the detour was up to 80 miles uh, uh, around. Uh, so, so again, that was uh, while it was uh, fairly remote, uh, it was a pretty critical lifeline for that part of the world out there. Sure. Okay, well, that looks like all the questions we've got, and we're probably running close to the end of our time. So I'm going to turn it back over to Brad for any final comments. Thanks, Travis. Very interesting. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And thanks to you both for doing a great job today. Geostrata Extra is always a lot of fun. Um, I mean, you guys know you can only put so much in six pages or I don't even know how many words they tell you to stick to. That's that's a secret that I'm not privy to, but uh, it's all right oh. uh, Pulling back the curtain for the viewers there. This is excellent. <laughs> but you guys did a great job. Author, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> that was really enjoyable. And I think one thing that I should say that I never say at the end of these things is for all of our viewers, if you would like to submit anything to Geostrata, can always reach out to us at geoinstituteasce.org and we'll get your ideas in the hopper and they will absolutely be considered. So you might want to do that. Another thing that I will pitch is that the 100th episode of Director's Cut is coming up soon. That's the weekly show where I interview one of our GI members, Jim Mitchell, geo legend Jim Mitchell, will be the guest on that 100th episode. If you've got a question you would like to ask Jim, 
We will put the link down in the notes underneath this video. You can click that, you can ask it, and if your question is chosen, you will get a $200 discount to Geo Congress 2023. So a little bit of interactivity there. Again, for all of our viewers, like, subscribe, get notifications. We will see you again very soon with another GeoStrata Extra and more Geo Institute live streams. Thanks for thank you for being with us today.